All right. Well, thank you for joining today. Welcome to Coffee and Cargo. We're happy to have you all here today. Um, we have some good topics that we're going to discuss here today. So I'll do some quick introductions. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'm the marketing manager here at Interlog USA. Um, and then we also have Justin Engelmeyer here. Uh, he's our VP here at Interlog and Ben Schwingel, our director of operations. So they're both going to touch on some good topics that we have here today. Um, so just to pull up a quick agenda for what we'll be discussing, um, we'll quick start off with our California port fees, what's currently happening with that. Um, and there were some new delays that took place this week on that. Um, and then we'll also touch on other terminals that are putting some port fees as well. And then we'll touch on some current events happening right now. But just so you guys are aware, we do have a Q&A at the end, but uh, if our, your question does not get answered today, please email our sales at interlogusa.com. Uh, we will definitely be reaching out to you directly if there's any questions or you guys want to discuss some of your current situations. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Otherwise, also email us at sales at interlogusa.com. Um, so I guess we'll begin. Justin, do you want to take it over? Yeah, sure. So I think the, the primary topic here um, are all these port fees that are happening due to congestion out in, out in Long Beach. Um, and so there's two actual ports there. There's Long Beach and there's the Los Angeles ports. And between the two, we have information that there's roughly around 50,000 containers sitting there that these fees would apply for at the moment. Um, and and it, there, there's a lot of questions as to who's being charged, how's it working, what's this total dollar amount and, and who's actually, who's, who's reaping the benefits of this and what are they doing with it? So there's a lot of questions to kind of work around here. So we'll do our best to try to answer all that. Um, first of all, this was supposed to start a couple of days ago on the 15th and it's been postponed until the 22nd. So we'll try to touch on that um, at the end of this too. But it's, it's how does this work? When do the containers start being assessed these fees? And there's two different ways. One is if, if, if it's being discharged out of those two ports, Long Beach or Los Angeles. So if you're having a trucker go in and drain it out to a local area there, or you're trucking it out of the, out of the seaports there, um, you have nine days. So on that ninth day, your container starts getting charged $100 a day. The 10th day, so day number two now being charged is $200 a day. Then it's $300 a day on day three and so on and so forth. And there is no max. So this just continues to go. Um, not all containers sit there for that long, but there's a fair amount. Again, right now, according to Freight Waves, they think that there's roughly 49,000, 50,000 containers that would be affected if this went, went into place this past uh, 15th. So, um, and, and not only that, some of these numbers are pretty staggering here. They think that the first day, if this happened on the 15th, that there would have been an excess of $4.8 million charged that day, which makes sense. They're saying there's 48, 49,000 containers there. And then they think that it would rise into tens of millions of dollars per day and topping off somewhere near $100 million a day by the end of the week. Mind you that Saturday, Sundays, holidays with Thanksgiving and stuff coming up next week, um, all of those days, they're saying that they will charge for this stuff. So um, again, and this is who gets charged for this? Well, the terminals are charging the carriers and then the carriers, most of them, um, they're all charging us something. So Ben can touch on that a little bit here, but then they're charging uh, the carriers in return are charging the importers. And so again, this is what they're saying they're gonna do. It's supposed to start on the 22nd here, but um, it's been postponed once. And due to amount of these, the, the fees adding up here, I think there's a lot of different concerns here right now. Ben, the, the terminals, correct me if I'm wrong, but the terminals at the moment are saying, well, they've seen some relief. Uh, so they've, they've held off on these charges, but there's gotta be a little bit more to that because it's not, I mean, there, there's still tons and tons of vessels floating around out there. What were, you were telling me the dwell time on an average vessel out there is something like 17 days. So it's not like that their problems have gone away. Do you wanna to touch base on that a little bit? 17 days, that's twice as long as it was in August. It's just been increasing to the point that now we're at almost 80 containers are at harbor outside of Los Angeles. 80 vessels, you mean? I'm sorry, 80 vessels, okay. yes. And we're talking about the decrease in congestion there and then the port announced this postponement because of the improvement 
Well, Bloomberg did announce 26% reduction in number of containers in the terminal since the fee was announced back on October 26th. So that 20 days, 0.5% reduction. But with the number of vessels coming in, um, trying to deliver before the holidays, that 25% is not going to make much of an impact on the behavior or the, uh, the results of the deliveries that most customers are expecting. Well, and I think also next week you have been, sorry to cut you off here. Next week, you also have Thanksgiving coming in. So that is a time where, where there's congestion, even when things, when it's normal, when, when you have normal volumes coming in there and there aren't vessels floating around waiting to be unloaded and you have a, a fair amount of chassis and truckers. I mean, that, that's a time that, that it's always congested and there's always problems and there's always delays around holidays. So I agree with you all. I see that there's, maybe 26% relief, um, it doesn't really add up to me. No, no all the normal rules are still in play. A demerge begins apply at the end of your contractual free time, which is usually four or five days according to your contract. So that's $200, $300 fee per day. This emergency fee applies on top of that. Oh. Now, the name of the game, especially with Thanksgiving around the corner, is getting those containers out of the port, even if that means just to a yard where they can be stacked somewhere outside of the, the seaport and be delivered later to avoid this incremental $100 fee. We got trucks and chassis, busy as you can imagine, booked out for weeks to be moving containers that haven't even uh, discharged yet. That's what the freight forwarders are focusing on, covering all their containers with various truckers. The other thing I so want to yep. jump right off the demerge applies just like it did before, especially with customs held containers. We don't know if a container is going to be held by customs for an intensive exam, which could last several days, or just a quick document examination, which may not have any impact at all. But this incremental fee will apply on top of demerge if customs decides to uh, do an exam. So, I mean, just, just sitting here and listening to all these fees adding up, um, you know, you, things start to run across your mind as to one, you know, how, how can carriers sit here and all of a sudden start charging you this stuff after you book something and you didn't know about it. I mean, that's, that's, that's not typical. You're not normally allowed to do that. So I, I think that there's lawsuits waiting to happen there, possibly, um, you know, I guess we're kind of going down the line of conspiracy theories here, but I think part of the reason why, why this was held up this week and it didn't start is they're trying to sort through some of these things. We're mentioning to merge on top of these other charges. At some point, the value of some of the products sitting in these containers isn't going to be worth the dollar amount that they owe. When you start talking about the excessive charges that, that already have been passed on to some of these importers, well, all the importers, um, you know, just your, your, your freight charges alone um, have quadrupled since last year, if not more. And now you're talking these other charges on top of it. I just think that at some point in time, they're, they're going to have, they're, they're going to put themselves in a very vulnerable situation of having a bunch of abandoned cargo sitting there if it gets too out of control. So, you know, I, I guess you, you're saying at, at one point, well, well, let's make sure we just get our containers out of there. That's, that's the best move that we can possibly do. If we can, if there's a way to pull them, get them to another yard, pay a storage charge at that other yard if you have to, yeah. um, whatever it is, get out of there. Um, and, and hopefully hopefully this doesn't happen. You know, Hopefully this gets postponed or they change the numbers, something happens. But let's talk about long-term also. Right now, are we booking? We're booking containers elsewhere, just avoiding Los Angeles. Because even if you made a booking today, what are the possibilities of that container having these charges coming in in a month, month and a half, whenever that might be? That's right. We've been diverting cargo through uh, other West Coast ports. Of course, it's been popular to take it into Houston if the final destination is somewhere in the Midwest. And the East Coast is um, in heavy demand, but there's still carriers increasing their services to the East Coast and more capacity there so we can take it what's called the RIPI it's like the reverse inland move from the East Coast to like the Ohio River Valley, Chicago, and uh, St. Louis. But um, we're seeing the West Coast carriers like CMA open up a new service and Costco, a dedicated expedited service through Prince Rupert down into Chicago. 
that's um, very attractive right now and perhaps seemed reactive to the Los Angeles conditions, but I think it is a good foresight for conditions that will remain in place there in Los Angeles for at least 90 days. I don't foresee this for emergency fee or at least the congestion there resolving until the end of Chinese New Year. Sure. And so I guess I, I think my main thing here um, with all the importers wondering what the heck's happening and how are these charges taking place and what's going on, um, I realize that, that we don't know 100%, again, since it's been postponed already once, what's actually going to happen next, next week. This right now, what we're telling you, this is what we're being told is going to happen. Um, and, and the most that I can say at this moment is you, you can see the, uh, our a link to our sales uh, our sales email address below here where you can email us and we can reach out and we can be in touch with you um, through the end of this week and into next week with with what we have and the information at that time you know at, at the moment I'm just not sure that we have much more than what we're saying here is there something Ben that you think that we haven't touched on I feel like we've pretty much included uh, everything that we know thus far about this no but conditions are changing daily Carriers are reacting and, and orders are booking accordingly. So just stay in communication with your forwarder on the new options. You know, as Justin pointed out, the team here is more than happy to discuss any new changes to this fee or the services that become available. Right. And, and if you're not working with us and you need to talk to your, you have a different forwarder at the moment, talk to them and see what they can do for you. See if they have somewhere that they can take the cargo for you. Um, just try to get it out of there as soon as possible. Ask them how long your containers have already been sitting there. Um, if they've already been sitting there, you know, if you're pushing a week by next week, Monday, um, th these charges could start happening to you. So make sure you check with your forwarders and see uh, how long the containers have already been sitting there at the port. Um, Rachel, do you want to move on to the next one here? We, we're going to touch base yes. as we have a little bit on some other. Oh, go ahead, Ben. And I just want to reiterate this so it's clear. No one's surprised. If you're booking cargo through the West Coast, the Los Angeles, Long Beach, inland. It goes through those ports. That's where the six days applies. Just so you know that the carriers will receive their bill from the terminal for containers that haven't been moved by the carrier from the seaport to the rail ramp to go inland to wherever it may be, St. Louis, Chicago, Kansas City, Dallas. So if your container hasn't been moved by the ocean carrier on a truck across town to the rail ramp, the terminal will build the carrier, carrier will build the importer. Except for one um, carrier, Marisk said they won't. Um, maybe others will take that lead, but they haven't so far. I know there's more details on our website, carrier by carrier. But that's an important thing to be aware of. Um, you're not uh, out of the, you're not in the clear just because you booked through Los Angeles to an inland point. You're just as vulnerable to this fee as someone important to just Los Angeles. That's right. So sorry, I forgot to touch base on that one. That's the other way. So one is if you're pulling it out to a local area or you're, you're trucking it out of the ports in Los Angeles or Long Beach. But the other is if you're moving IPI, if you're moving inland on the rail here, which your forwarder has very little control over, it's really just the carrier, um, the ocean carrier that you that's that the cargo is booked with. Um, it, they have to move it from the terminal to the rail ramp. And if they don't do that in six days, you these these same fees start um, applying. So yeah, that's that's another question to ask uh, and, and make sure that your forwarders are on top of it and they can tell you what to expect. So yeah, good good point, Ben. Go ahead, Rachel. All right, so then Tacoma. No, Tacoma is a little bit different. Ben, we, you, I'll let you start off and touch base on that. The other ones was, you know, they're saying after X amount of days, it's going to be an incremental $100 first day, $200 the second day, $300, $400, $500, and, and it just never ends. Th this one seems to be a little bit different, and, and it seems more to sensible. be a little bit more. Right. After we hear <laughs> more sensible in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what it would be. Yeah, California, Long Beach. These were announced in like late October. About a week later, Tacoma, um, the two terminals are Washington United and Husky announced a $315 flat one-time fee for containers that haven't either moved inland on the rail or been pulled from their seaport terminal after 15 days. So not significant, but still uh, that's a big dollar amount if um, you're accustomed to waiting a lot of time to uh, pull your containers or see delays on the rail between 
um, Seattle and a lot of common inland points from Seattle or Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit. Right. While, while it's $315, which seems minimal compared to what can happen in Long Beach, I mean, it's, it's again, it's another charge tacked on, mm-hmm. stacked on top of the, the amount of charges that the importers have already um, been facing. So it's just one more one more fee that they're stuck with paying. So it's, it's certainly not a pleasant thing. And uh, we do have some other terminals that we'll be talking about, I believe, towards the end during our current events here. And they're trying to come up with some other unique things to resolve the situation. Rachel, if you want to. All right. Oh, well, here we are. We're at the current events. Stink bugs. I'll, I'll let you take that one, Ben. Near and dear to my heart. I'll uh, export <laughs> to Australia. No, typically, you could send your containers to Australia to be fumigated there. Since they're the receiving country that has the regulations, to prevent stink, stink bugs from invasive species from disrupting their ecosystem. They have uh, the regulation that every container has to be fumigated. So they have their own fumigation facilities there. Um, it's not cheap or expensive. It's somewhere between three to $700 a container um, to be fumigated in Australia. But they've become so overwhelmed, the number of imports, just like the United States has, that they no longer can accept fumigation in their own country. They have to, in the, in the United States, we have to fumigate it before it exports. And since this is a regulation in Australia, we don't have the facilities like they do. So you're looking at finding those fumigation places at the seaports, rarely inland, uh, which means you have to find a new way to rail it to that seaport um, port of loading or truck it there and fumigate it for several days before the container's allowed to engage. It's just more planning required by your freight forwarder, uh, more planning advanced by the, the shipper. So please be talking in, about the stink bug season, which basically call it a season when it lasts from September to April. But all that time, if the container is received in Australia, it has to have been fumigated beforehand. Sure. So then we're talking about the United States reopening its borders for fully vaccinated travelers. And, and what does this really do for us here? Um, you know, this right now, air freight's, uh, it's at what, an all time high bin. I mean, the rates are through the roof um, and, and the people that are trying to get their freight in here as quickly as possible, they always use air freight. Um, and, and there just haven't been that many flights available. So for those who don't know, there's two different types of planes that your cargo actually goes on. One is just a cargo plane. So there are no passengers, but there are actually, there is a lot of cargo on your passenger plane. So as there's more flights coming across um, due to the borders open, being opened up, that's gonna actually allow a little bit more available space to, for, for you to send some air freight. And, and Ben, do you wanna to touch on that at all? I mean, the, the rates are what they are. Have you heard anything about them coming down? I don't know if that's gonna happen with the holidays and, and whatnot, but. It's a welcome relief to have this um vaccination, vaccinated travelers accepted because as you touched on, rates are through the roof. Well, that means that at record levels again that we're seeing in the spring of 2020 when everyone was trying to ship masks and gloves and all that PPE. And we're back at that level while we try to import last minute Amazon online shopping items onto the shelves and the warehouses. Do I expect rates to drop? Uh, I think there'll be certain carriers and certain routes that are more sensible. It might not be a direct route into Los Angeles for me at Stocking or Chicago, but a a five day route through maybe Japan and Alaska down into Seattle that trucks to Portland. These other options are out there and they're sometimes two or $3 less per kilo. But when you're talking with your freight forward about air freight, have an expectation of your delivery timeline and, uh, and price and be upfront with them because there's so many air carriers and routes available that you need to know what's available to you. And, and don't expect that you're gonna be able to book a 40 foot containers worth of cargo onto one single plane. Likely that would be broken up into four or five different shipments. And that's best for you because if one of those trunks was booked altogether, but it was held up for customs or whatever it was, the rest of it wouldn't be able to deliver until that 
last piece was arrived at the uh, airport of arrival. Right, and, it, and I think you, you touched on it, and, and one of the things that I think um, is, is the most important with air freight, as always, when you say, tell them what your timeline looks like, meaning I look at it as when do you actually need it here so then we can kind of go backwards from there. So a three to five day transit time, what does that really look like? Um, that's if it departed today and then it's at what? It's at the airport in Savannah or at some other airport in the US um, and then you have to deliver it. So make sure that you're, you're talking to your forwarder about the date that you actually need it here and you can go backwards from there to ensure that you're picking out the best flights and transit for it. So you know when that flight departs, when you can expect it to arrive, and then your, your forwarder should have some sort of estimated time frame on when they'd be able to deliver it from there. Um, so yeah, I think that's an important part. All right, the Peer Pass update. Ben, you can talk about that one. This was announced yesterday um, in Southern California. The Peer Pass has been a longstanding fee that's charged to um, encourage truckers to pull containers at nighttime instead of congesting the roads during their normal workday traffic. So historically, this fee was about $33 per TEU. That's a 20 foot equivalent unit. So $33 for a 20 and $66 for a 40 foot container that was outgated during the workday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then a couple of years ago, that pure pass was set at a flat amount, regardless of the time of day you pulled it out of the C terminal or around $38. And yesterday was announced that there'll be a temporary fee increase in December and January of this year, um, that about $40 more per TEU. So you're gonna be looking at roughly you know, $225 to pull your container out of the Los Angeles port between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. during these next two months. All right. See, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's just another one tacked on. Maybe we weren't expecting it. So here's a, a heads up. Sure. All right. Well, then I guess there's some decent news if you're coming into Georgia. Georgia, the terminals down there, it seems as though they've been working on a different, a different way. Instead of just charging you more and more and more, it seems like they are now taking upon themselves to open up other yards, other container, container yards uh, that they're going to put some of the containers into. And it's starting out with, I believe today, it's actually trying to open up here, um, a yard that's gonna have about 43,000 spots available for containers to go into. And then in the middle of December, another yard that they're trying to clear out where there's an additional 100,000 containers or so that can go into that. Uh, ben, have you heard much about some of the freight that we're moving about them going to those yards or is that still kind of in the works and we'll see how that, that plays out? That's recently announced. So it's really happy to see that our friends down there in Georgia are making these uh, solutions for large amounts of cargo, whether it's outside of Savannah or outside of Atlanta. Just recently, some carriers started omitting Savannah because of the congestion, notably Havoc Lloyd, which is a frustration. It's like your container got rolled for something completely out of everyone's control. But these uh, recently announced solutions haven't had an impact on the bookings per se, when the container yards are just becoming available today and another one announced for mid-December. We'll see booking impact uh, in the next few weeks and probably be talking about it in our next webinar in December. Sure, okay. All right, Rachel, what do we have next for us? Perfect. Um, so we do have our Q&A right now. There's, a, there's quite a few questions um, about the port fees. So I'll just kind of ask kind of a few of those right now so you guys can quickly answer them. So some people are asking with Tacoma and LA doing these port fees, do you see more ports starting to implement this fee in the future? Um, and then another question on top of that too is, well, do you feel that there's gonna be lawsuits over these new port fees? Um, you know, I personally, I, I, I guess this is just kind of a, our own opinions at the moment here. Um, I do, I do see that lawsuits could be in play. Um, and I, I think, that would be my guess as to why it wasn't implemented on Monday. I, I really do. I don't, I don't see how they can charge this much money um, after it's already been booked. I could see it if it was on future containers coming in. So if you're making bookings right now, going to Long Beach, I could, 
I could understand some of these excessive fees. Um, I just, I feel like they're going to have a hard time with it, but I'm not saying that they won't, I, I guess that's just my opinion. Um, I mean, these are some really, really extreme charges. So, and some of them, especially some of them, you don't have any, you have no control over it. Um, you know, there's a chassis shortage, there's a driver shortage. It's not like people don't want their cargo. Everyone wants their cargo right now. So <laughs> to, to, tax people for something when they're trying to get their cargo out of there and saying, well, your cargo is sitting here and it's taking up our space. It's, it, it just, it seems tough and it seems like something that the certain people will, will fight for. So who knows? I, I don't know exactly where I'm going with that, but. And if the ports don't announce it, maybe Houston won't formally make an announcement. The truckers have to wait in these lines for many hours. And what ends up happening happened in Miami a couple months ago, and it had been long standing in New York, the New York terminals is that truckers charge a congestion fee, meaning like a wait time fee. It might not necessarily be paid to the terminal, but it's a, a trucker cost that becomes a fixed rate to always account for. I, I could see that happening as everyone shifts um, from Los Angeles to Oakland and Seattle or maybe even East Coast, like uh, definitely New York and, and Miami. Let's hope not Savannah, because we want to keep those containers moving through Savannah. Well, you know, we touch on this a little bit though. We've seen a reduction in the, in the freight coming in right now. So let's not forget about that. Let's not be all doom and gloom. And, and hopefully as it's reduced a little bit coming in here, the, the mad rush, the peak season um, is over while things are still jammed up at these ports. Um, hopefully there is some relief as, as the, the cargo lessens as it comes in here um, through the end of this year and at the very beginning of January. So hopefully it's not as bad as it has been and, and we can come up with some other solutions at that time. Right now, they're, they're threatening this, but nothing's official until that day one when they start charging it and they try to collect their money. So let, let's keep that in mind and, and hopefully something else happens. Um, Again, I urge you to, to talk to your current forwarders and to, to reach out to us at that sales at interlogusa.com. We can reach out to you directly and answer any questions that you have specifically and, and keep you up to date. Um, we're more than happy to do that whenever you have questions and, and help you out individually. So uh, please do reach out to us and ask us if you have questions. We can, we can hopefully answer them for you. Awesome. Well, that kind of wraps up our webinar, webinar today. Um, I do see that there's quite a few questions still in here. So again, please feel free to reach out to us at sales at analogusa.com. Um, and then for our next webinar, it's going to be on December 15th, again, 10 o'clock central time. Um, so we will be sending out um, a place to sign up in our newsletters and then also sending out it on our socials as well. So hopefully you're able to attend the next one and thanks for uh, listening in on today's webinar. Thank you, Ben and Justin. Yep, thanks guys. Thank you. Have a good one.